So I'm Renee Crane. I'm a program manager at the National Science Foundation in the Office of Polar Programs. And I am one of the two co-chairs of a group of people in uh, the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee who worked on revising the principles for the conduct of research in the Arctic. And so I'll give you a little bit of background and walk you through the revised version that's now out for public comment. Um, and Roberto Delgado, my co-chair, was not able to be with us today. Get it to Adrian. Maybe, there we go, there you okay. Go. Um, so a little bit of background. The principles for the conduct of research in the Arctic were re released in 1990. Um, they were prepared by an interagency social science task force, and um, the principles were very helpful, and they largely focused on um, aspects of social scientists going to communities and working closely with communities, and, um, and very much promoted um, mutual respect and communication between Arctic residents and scientists. But in the time since 1990, so many things have advanced and the way in which researchers are working with communities has grown into a new type of language that we use to describe those collaborations like co-production of knowledge and, um, and community-based monitoring. And so to reflect how researchers are working with communities and advances that have been made and um, to strengthen the principles, to make them more broadly applicable to all types of research that are taking place in the Arctic, not, uh, with not a focus on any one particular research area, and also to kind of um, regenerate interest in the principles and buy-in from the federal agencies that are part of IARPIC, there are 14 federal agencies that support research in the Arctic. Uh, we decided about a year ago to undertake a revision of those principles and um, moderate, modernize them and, and re-release them. Um, so there's a, a working group that was established by the, um, the staff group of IARPIC. Um, so Roberto and I chaired it and we had members from many different federal agencies. We, we established two different sub teams. There's a drafting team that worked heavily on redrafting the language and an outreach team um, that I'll talk about a little bit more who's um, developed some products to help um, reach out to people with the revised draft to make sure that we get a lot of stakeholder input. Um, so the first thing that we did was actually put the existing principles out for review and let people know that we were undertaking this process and get feedback on the existing principles. So we asked people questions like what what about the existing principles should we keep? What principles are most important? Uh, what ways, it, in, in which ways is engagement between communities and researchers, um, in which ways can it be improved? And how can IARPIC ensure wide dissemination and use of the principles? And we discovered some interesting things. Many agencies were already aware and using the principles, um, and while others um, had sort of, again, become a little bit outdated for some agencies. We also um, made an effort to go to uh, meetings in Alaska and to meet with Alaska Native people, as well as people at federal agencies and academic researchers. Um, so here's a list of some of the places where we had members our, of our committee go in order to get direct input from people. We also had a federal register notice. Um, and uh, we reached out in conversations with people and, and through the IRPIC collaborations portal. We received some really good comments on the existing document that helped shape how we revise those principles into the new draft. We also did an extensive literature review, including um, academic research and also similar documents, similar principles for conducting research documents. Um, and so we worked throughout the winter to develop a direction that the principles would go in. And then um, this spring worked um, on establishing the set of principles and really iterated what the specific language would be. And we opened the comment period on July 5th. Um, we sent out a federal register notice and we also sent it out through as many networks as we could. And we continue to do outreach like this in order to get um, as many stakeholders to provide input as we can. We really wanna have a set of principles 
that has a lot of buy-in and common understanding for people and that are clear and specific. Um, so there's two steps left here in our process that are in gray. We will take the comments that we're receiving now and revise the draft one more time. And then in October, our goal is to submit the revised principles document to the heads of the agencies who represent um, their agencies to IRPIC, the IRPIC principles group, uh, to approve and adopt them. And they will become a deliverable at what's known as the Arctic Science Ministerial, which is a, a large international conference that will take place in Berlin in October, um, and really promote the implementation of the principles doc document. Um, so this is an overview of the, the past year um, that we spent working on revising um, the document and sending it out for public comment. And this is what we have left to do, as I mentioned, um, to continue to do outreach and gather comments. We've received already um, about a dozen comments to our email alias, uh, IARPICPrinciples at nsf.gov. Um, that are substantive and, and helpful edits for clarity. And um, so uh, let's see. Somehow I missed this, I skipped over this slide, which is the revised principles. So one of the goals, as I mentioned, was to make um, a set of principles that were broadly applicable and that people could remember and, and understand what is, um, what is meant. So the five main principles are be accountable, establish effective two-way communication, respect local culture and knowledge, build and sustain relationships, and pursue responsible environmental stewardship. And in the document itself, within each of the main principles, there are several sub-bullets that highlight some of the really important um, elements that the, the drafting group um, thought were important to highlight. Um, within Be Accountable, we included a sub bullet um, about promoting a work environment that's safe and harassment free for all people, including the research team, including the people that they work with and the communities that they're in. Um, uh, within two way communication, we talk about really working with stakeholders who are interested in the project to establish that two way communication. Um, and so within each of the bullets, you'll find some more specific information. Um, and that's where we could really use input to make sure that it's clear, concise, and complete. Um, so one of the pieces of feedback that we received during our early outreach is that, act, that producing a short video about what we're trying to accomplish is a really good way to get people in Alaska to engage. And so the communications subgroup worked with Alaska Teen Media Institute to produce a short video that explains the principles and helps draw people in um, to provide comments. Um, so I think I will now take you to um, the website that we have for IARPIC. Okay, so on the IARPIC Collaborations Portal, there's a page dedicated to this process and to the documents. Um, it explains a little bit about what we're doing, and here is the video, which uh, I'll show you in just a moment. It also walks you through the process, the main principles, and this is the place where you can go um, to find out how to comment. This is the email alias. Um, there's a collaboration Facebook page. You can use the IARPA Collaborations portal. Um, email me or Roberto directly. And we also provide the old document, the 1990 version, and the revised version here that you can download and comment on. Um, for some of our um, agency representatives who are attending meetings, we have a flyer that they can print out and use as an outreach tool. And then the slides that I've presented here are also available at the bottom um, so that people can kind of walk through what the process was, who the committee members and things were, and things like that. Um, so we did make this video. It, it, the uh, Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, or IARPIC, was created in 1984 as part of the Arctic Research and Policy Act. IARPIC serves as a place where all of the federal agencies that support scientific research in the Arctic can coordinate, share ideas and good practices, and co-support projects. IARPIC adopted the principles for the conduct of research in the Arctic to provide clarity to researchers working in the Arctic on expectations for their behavior and conduct of research while in the Arctic. 
Since 1990, when the original principles were released, the Arctic has undergone changes and so has the way in which researchers work with communities. The revised principles document captures the most important elements of working in the Arctic, accountability, respect, communication, building relationships, and stewardship of the environment. In Kotzebue, we spent the first year of our project working with our advisory council to design our hypotheses before starting any other research activities. And this project is still ongoing and we remain closely engaged with the community as we collect and interpret our data. The other thing about that is to acknowledge that indigenous peoples have always been researchers, um, not necessarily in the ways that Western academia and Western ways have um, defined research, you know, we, we've always been really good observers. We've always been um, experimenting and understanding with our land and our environment. So we're researchers in our own right too. There are a diversity of opinions and thoughts about the value of the research we do. You know, we're always looking for ways to better engage with folks in the communities. Our research is highly relevant to the communities as their knowledge is highly relevant to our research. Even as an insider, as an indigenous and local person, sometimes there's skepticism as to why I work in that field and what my intentions are. But always being an authentic, real person first, being a new back first, being a mother first, and sharing very openly what the intentions are and why I'm collaborating is really beneficial. And I believe in research serving our people in our communities. Most of our research centers on how wildlife is responding to the changing environmental conditions and folks that live in these communities, the communities that we base out of, are experiencing many of those changes. Additionally, some of the species that we study are culturally and nutritionally important to these communities, so there's a mutual desire to ensure the long-term persistence of those species. The revised principles for conducting research in the Arctic is now available for public comment. Comments on the revised principles will help ensure the final version includes diverse perspectives and covers the broad range of research conducted in the Arctic. The principles should serve as a guide for working in the Arctic and are a reminder of what is most fundamentally important when planning and conducting research in the Arctic. Thank you for participating in the process to revise the IARPIC principles for conducting research in the Arctic. Your comments will make this document better. All right. So that is the overview. Um, one of the key features that I also wanted to mention is that we did uh, change the title from uh, principles for the conduct of to principles for conducting research. and. Um, and with that, I will open it up for questions, discussion, or um, anything that anyone on the phone would like to bring up regarding the principle. I'd like to remind you to go ahead and um, unmute yourself to ask your question, um, or you can raise your hand, or you can um, type a question in the chat box. I would also add for those of you that are only calling in that all the slides and everything that Renee is showing are available on the public side of the website. Renee, for this anyone who, oh, go ahead. Yep. Renee, this is uh, Gay Sheffield in Noam. Hi, Gay. Hi. So I, I'm sorry I missed the first um, five minutes or so. I was out of the office. Um, so my understanding is this document is to provide clarity to researchers. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, I think because we're the IARPIC agencies, we're really speaking to the people who receive funding or are employed by the agencies to be researchers. Um, you know, we would love for more people to kind of implement this, this approach. But that's really the audience that we as the IARPIC agencies can speak to, is the research community. And has there been any um, sort of summary or, or look at where communities where conflict has occurred? Um, has there been any look at either addressing, sort of summarizing what has been the conflict and where and or um, once you know that, going to get 
information directly. I know you're going to all these um, public um, meetings and, and, and looking for, um, you're soliciting for input. Have you looked for where there have been problems in the past and then target those communities for input? Yeah. So, I mean, that is a, that is a great point. And so we have not in a systemic, you know, sort of systematic scientific way analyzed the conflicts that, that, you know, I think you would have to talk to a lot of different agencies and a lot of different people to really get um, around that. But I would say that the people who are on this working group are familiar with a, a broad array of areas where there have been conflict. Um, a lot of it is in the area where you work in the coastal region and has very much to do with subsistence food. We also see it with people who are using aircraft in the interior that may have the tendency to spook caribou. And there may be other um, elements as well. And it, sometimes you get into sort of the archaeology and where um, if there are human remains or certain sensitive cultural elements um, or anyone who's going to maybe do like a fertilization process or something to the tundra, people might be concerned or have questions about how that might impact the vegetation that they, you know, then uh, gather food from. So I think there is a broad array um, all across Alaska in particular, and then elsewhere in the Arctic, there are some other issues. So I, I think that that would be um, an interesting thing for the agencies to spend some time on. Um, so these principles were written, uh, you know, drafted by people who are, have a broad awareness of what some of the major issues are. And uh, the IARPIC agencies are putting them out there as um, the expectations and the hopes for how we how people will behave and then um, Where there are specific conflicts it may be better um, Resolved by that funding agency in the community or the re depends a little bit on the on the specifics there um, You know our goal and, and one of the things that we promote in terms of communication and respect is Actually, if there is a conflict work through it Let's, you know, people need to be talking to each other, need to understand what the issues are. In many cases, we've seen those conflicts come to some acceptable resolution. For example, a cruise timing might get shifted, or they might do a cruise track in reverse uh, to avoid a subsistence hunting area or species. So um, to the, you know, to the greatest extent possible, conflicts that arise should be addressed at that lowest level. Um, but I think if we have some other bigger issues, that's something that the IARPIC agency should be talking about. And um, we can talk about that more too, Gay. And so I don't know if that's a great answer to the question. That's kind of the context that we're in is to, to promote these principles and then and deal with conflicts as they come up. And um, if, if it's needed to go back and um, address some things that are maybe longer standing or systematic kind of issues. I think that's something that IRP agency should talk about. Well, I've, I do have more questions, but I'll let other people ask. I'll take a break. Thank you okay. very much. This is Jennifer Mercer. Can I ask a question? Hi, Jen. Sure. Okay. Um, so, so my understanding is that this is meant, as you explained, to cover Research U.S. researchers who see, who receive funding from U.S. funding agencies, and it seems like most of the input um, from local communities was from Alaskan uh, communities or organizations. And so, how do you see this translating to working in local communities in other countries or other parts of the Arctic outside beyond Alaska? Yeah, so I think that's a good point. We did, a lot of our focus was on Alaska. Um, we did reach out to the permanent participant groups that represent um, the indigenous um, groups more broadly um, for comments. And um, so I think there's a mutual awareness, but in different regions of the Arctic, there are other um, documents or policies in place in some cases, not everywhere. But for example, if you go to work in Russia, you need to become familiar, or not, uh, I meant Canada, sorry. When you go to work in Canada, you need to become familiar with where you're working and what their expectations are and work through those communities and their process. Um, and so that, you know, the overall uh, idea that we want to promote is to be working effectively with, with people wherever you are um, and to be following the protocols and the cultural norms 
wherever you're working in the Arctic. And I think that through this comment period, it's a good opportunity to get feedback from other nations. And if you uh, want to walk this through um, in Greenland, for example, and see if there are any comments um, that we can we can get out of the government of Greenland or communities, that would be really helpful too. This is a good opportunity to do that before it gets closer to final. Yeah, I was thinking it, it might be good to ask the Greenland Research Council um, mm -hmm. in addition to the government of Greenland, but I, I think in particular the Greenland Research Council might be able Great. to provide some feedback. I can also walk it through Faro as well. Okay. And I, I did want to mention that anyone is welcome to email me or call me if, uh, if you think of something later or there's something that might be better discussed um, in a one-on-one -on -one or something, we can always do that as well. So um, this is not your one and only opportunity. It's just a one opportunity to hear a little bit about the process and where we're headed and provide us with some feedback or questions. Well, Renee, this is this is Gay again. If nobody else has another question, hey, Gay. Um, so you know, I was I, I Candace came to the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission meeting and and showed the video, and and that was great. And it made me think. Um, this is again. This is for the researchers. When I, it's got great. I love the way that the um, goals are very short, like be accountable, be respectful, that sort of thing. Is there a, a feedback or will there be, or does do the agencies have, or IARPIC talk about a feedback mechanism by which the stakeholders can, yeah. can say this has been good research or mm -hmm. this has not been good research? Like, I don't know what, how the agencies, how you mm -hmm. plan on, when you say be accountable, how does mm -hmm. that, what does that actually mean in, in, mm -hmm. in the terms of either the funder, the funding agency, or the individual, or a larger topic? I mean, there's lots of levels to, to good, bad, and ugly, right. and, and I'm just wondering, is there, will there be a feedback mechanism by which then you'll have an example of this is what a sustainable relationship looks like, or this is what effective two-way communication means. Because I see those, and I think those are really good goals, um, but I personally don't know when you say make sure communication, or we're looking for whatever your thing was, effective two-way yeah. communication. Like, how, what does that look like? Or what does IARPIC or NSF, what do you have in your mind when you say that? And right. And so I don't know if this is a, a living document or uh, I'll, I'll leave yeah. it at that for a feedback mechanism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think a feedback me mechanism mechanism is an interesting idea. Um, I think that the reality is that each individual agency has purview over the researchers or, you know, the, for NSF, when we give a grant, it's the institution that um, would have any, you know, would have, the main recourse, although NSF does have, we have certainly made it clear that we have some recourse if people are not behaving well in the field. So I think there's a variety of potential responses across the agencies, but I think collecting the information would be really useful. Um, I think that we've had, we've had some really good conversations about what, you know, why, why do we say effective two-way communication? And, uh, you know, in short, what we know over many many years is that it doesn't it's it's not really communicating if you just email a community and say i'm coming or call and leave a voicemail on one person's phone in the mayor's office or something that is not communicating about your research in an effective way and so um, we stretched we kind of asked people to stretch in two-way communication doesn't mean that everyone is going to be happy all the time or that there's going to be a co-production project that evolves, but it can simply be a conversation where um, the researcher explains 
here's what I want to do, and they, there's an opportunity for people to ask questions or express interest or concern and to address those issues and then for the research to proceed. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of draw on a personal example where I was doing a research project on birds um, outside of Nome, and when I met with the um, local um, village corporation about it, the conversation went a little bit like, hey, you know, this is the project, you know, you're pretty familiar, it's been going on for years, and their question was, you know, we're concerned you might find an endangered species that then, you know, it's gonna create a lot of headaches for us. And I assured them I was studying the most common shorebird tongue command and that there, you know, really was no um, expectation that anything like that was gonna happen. And they said, great, go, go do your research. And so that's a level of two-way communication where somebody has the opportunity to say, hey, you know, what concerns me about this is, is X. Um, and so, but you know, the, the agencies are not, you know, gonna moderate every conversation, but that's kind of the expectation. That's the hope that we're going for, that you're gonna go to an, a whaling commission meeting and talk to people, or you're gonna go to the waterway safety committee meeting and talk to people, hear concerns, modify your project, or, you know, or whatever the process is. Maybe it's getting an incidental harassment authorization or something. So um, there's a whole spectrum of research and, and levels of concern or interest and the idea is to just have that conversation. That's what we want to promote. You can't just email and say we're coming and then show up and <laughs> think that you have communicated. Um, and the second one that kind of involves um, a little bit of feedback is um, uh, sorry, there's two way communication and um, build and sustain relationships, right? Because Maybe you relationships. Could put the I'm sorry, maybe oh, yeah. you could put your slides up with the goals. Yeah, um, and again, relationships is a two-way. It's, it's on that. Oh, it's not in it's this on one. the PowerPoint, uh, okay. yeah. Um, building relationships is something that takes time and um, an effort, and it takes more than one person to, you know, to make that happen. But we're talking about everything from, did I get the right one? I don't think so. Oh, I did not. Um, everything from when you go to a community and you're interacting with people, you're shopping at local um, businesses, you're maybe visiting schools. I mean, all of those things are reflect back on researchers um, and the work that they're doing, the agencies they represent, or institutions if they're from universities. And and so building and sustaining relationships. I think you know that the concerns that we hear a lot are we don't like uh, when people just kind of fly in and fly out and um, you know we want people to talk to us about what research they're planning and so that's the two-way communication and the building relationships piece it's aspirational it's something that we want people to work toward um, and there, each of these relationships is going to look different and you know par part of the, of the purpose of the video was to feature some scientists who, you know, probably early in their careers didn't necessarily envision how closely they would be working with local people. But they found over time that they spent in the Arctic how, how much that really added to their research and how much they gained and how much they've, they also gained by feeling they were giving back um, and, and, you know, employing people and getting to know people. And, and that's, you know, kind of, that's what, the, the purpose of the document is to kind of lead people in that direction, encourage that behavior, support it. Um, so, Renee? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I, I live out in, in western Alaska. I live out in the Bering Strait region. Um, mm -hmm. We're really familiar with, with a lot of this. Um, and I know it's difficult to sort of, it's a struggle to sort of tell someone who you funded from Florida, you know, all these things. But have mm -hmm. you guys, I mean, in Alaska, we have, at least in Western and Northern Alaska, and I'm sure, I, I can't speak for the rest of Alaska, but we have regional communication centers. And mm -hmm. we also have, within each region, we're sort of set up in boroughs and regional places with di totally very different governmental styles between our regions. Yeah. Um, and yet we all have regional communication networks primarily based in the 
transportation hubs of Western and Northern Alaska, i.e. Nome, Kotzebue, um, Utkiagvik, uh, Dillingham, Unalaska, Bethel. Those would be mm -hmm. the ones I would go to. So within each one of those hubs, we have massive regional communication networks. We're talking every day about this and that, and we have to deal with that because um, a lot of what we talk about is, hey, there's this researcher, so forth and so on. Or right now we're going to have an emergency um, extended northbound survey of the fisheries, NOAA fisheries, right? They're coming up north mm. from the southern Bering Sea, and they're going to be doing some nearshore surveys with very um, not a lot of time to let people know. And, and uh, I don't know if you're aware of that. And so we have these communication networks and, and a lot of, I shouldn't say a lot, some people are finally understanding that tapping into the regional existing communication networks are very helpful for researchers yeah. because we're able to comprehensively um, disseminate information and sort of point them in the right direction. And each, you know, there, they may not be federal entities, they may be borough entities, they may be uh, UAF entities, they may be local entities, tribal entities. But is there a way that you capture that in your, um, you know, your, your mm -hmm. principles for conducting research in the Arctic and maybe help guide researchers, not just the one-on-one, -on -one, because what happens often is when we have researchers from afar going in and they have a really specific target, like a community or a type of fish, they mm -hmm. want to rewrite all the communication to go from that community or that tribe about this research effort back to wherever they come, Indiana. So mm -hmm. they start to break actually our, our regional communication mm -hmm. network. They miss out on diving in and being a part of what the warp and weave of our own day-to-day -day regional communications. But then they also can do damage. Um, they don't know it. They're, they're being accountable. They're establishing effective two-way communication. They're doing all these right things, but they end up maybe harming a, um, the network as we know it. Is, mm -hmm. is, that, is that something that you guys are looking at as far as trying to maybe point researchers at, tra at, the, at the transportation hubs in rural Alaska such that, and I'm only speaking for the coast, but I'm sure it would be the same for inland maybe, um, to, to sort of join these, these communication networks with their, you know, I'd like I'm, to try to handle those so we can give yeah. people, um, and they're a little more comfortable also, oftentimes in the transportation hubs or at least dealing with that so we can, we can sort of help them disseminate information or help guide them using these principles. So I think there have been efforts over the years to try to define or document how you get into those communication networks. Where do you, who do you reach out to in order to get those networks? Um, none of the past efforts have been that successful at mapping it out and kind of providing a direct point of contact with an email and a phone number. But I do feel like those networks have evolved and um, maybe gotten to a point where, at least for some parts of the Arctic and of Alaska in particular, you could actually develop uh, some sort of document or database of how, you know, how, for this area, where do you get, where do you go in and send your information? Um, and maybe it would be worth piloting something like that for those regions where we know. Uh, you know, if you're going to Kiagavik, you go here. If you're going to uh, Bering Strait, you go here. Um, so I think that's another, I, I, I'm, we're taking notes because <laughs> I think that's something for IARPIC to talk about. Um, is that something that we could work on and work with the agency representatives in Alaska, other folks in Alaska who have, you know, pertinent roles and also, uh, you know, the uh, native corporations and the communities and the boroughs um, and kind of get some input and uh, in that way as well. So, I, and then, I mean, I, I think got one more and then I'll hard. stop. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. Um, and that is each region 
in western and northern Alaska are set up very differently, very differently. Mm -hmm. For example, yep. the Bering Strait region has no borough. We have no borough government. And one of the things I haven't seen that is amazing to me when we have federally funded researchers come out is the sort of a, a lack of understanding regarding maybe tribal, and I haven't heard it yet here really, uh, tribal, um, uh, you know, the federal to federal tr tribal oh, right. communications. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it's consultation, but just how it works, that, that even the basics mm -hmm. of, you know, when you go into rural Alaska, and, and I could be wrong here, someone could jump in and I'd be happy with that, but when you go into rural Alaska, you're always going to find three entities, right? You're going to find the, the city government that's funded. You're going to find tribal uh, offices and what their role is and what their responsibility is. And then the corporation for that tribe and what their role and what their responsibilities are. And even something like that, because I spend a lot of time trying to... Um, I'm educating the researchers a lot, and, and uh, I think something that might help them, especially when they're coming in with federal funding, remember, the end product is not just clarity probably for the researchers. It would be really good to lay down what your expectations are for the stakeholders. Hopefully, they will be learning. Um, they, have a, um, they have a real want and a need to understand how this works at the research end. Because we're getting all these people starting, to, not starting, all the people coming and they're, they're saying, well, I'm, I'm funded by NOAA or I am NOAA or I am Fish and Wildlife or I am from University of Pensacola. So it's very, very confusing for the stakeholders. And I don't know um, if there's some thought about the end goal for not just conducting good research in the Arctic, but hopefully what the federal agencies, to smooth your way forward, what you are thinking about as far as messaging to stakeholders when you set this document out. Because I think there's a lot of room here to, um, to educate people as well in that they have a message they can tell back to the communities on how things work. So anyway, that's it for me. Um, thanks for having this opportunity. Okay, thank you for those suggestions. Um, that's you. Oh, is it? Okay. So somehow I'm still sharing. Um, so I think that it's apparent that, you know, so putting the principles out there is an important step, but it's not everything. And there is a lot more that can be done to, ha to really facilitate um increased collaboration and coordination um and i think that we at the iarpic organizations and within different collaboration teams there can be conversations about how um to do more of this kind of collaboration to document um yeah how you reach into those networks and that kind of thing so i really appreciate you kind of laying out some of the key things that um would really kind of back up um, the establishing the principles to help people be better able to implement them. Do we have more questions or comments from folks on the phone or on Zoom? There was a chat. I find it. So from Carl New Year, we have, um, in order to support effective two-way communication, such as attending AEWC meetings, is there a general agreement from the funding agencies that support will be made available to researchers, e.g. travel funds? Often such engagement happens only after funding is mm -hmm. awarded and field research plans are relatively far along. Yeah. I can only speak for my agency on that one. 
which is that we encourage people to request funding for um, initial visits. We have some mechanisms to support um, planning visits, but that, you know, it's not ubiquitous to all of the agencies. Uh, and I think it's a really good suggestion to actually support financially and enable that early communication to happen. Oftentimes I think it happens when people have a funded project and then they're kind of building on it and they're looking at their next proposal and then they have you know, then they're able to you know have those conversations with if already had a project um, funded so that's a good point Carl and I I shared briefly and I'll share it again um, the principles themselves um, and the reason I'm sharing them is because there are the headers that are be accountable, establish effective two-way communication. But if you haven't had an opportunity to actually pull them up, you'll see that there's a lot of detail, as Renee said in mm -hmm. her, in her um, comments at the beginning, of detail behind each of these. And so comments on the detail level are also welcomed yeah. and encouraged. And they are available on the website in the um, and on the Federal Register notice. You can get to them either way. Oh no, they're not stated. Are there other comments? Okay. Well, I want to thank everyone who joined us. We had a very good turnout for this listening session. Um, I hope that you provide us comments and feedback and also um, share this draft of the revised principles through your network um, to help engage more people in this process. We really appreciate it. And I would just add that we've recorded today's um, presentation and it, along with everything else, will be posted on the website so you can share this if you happen to be going to a meeting you can share the video which is also posted and there is a flyer there as well that you can print i i guess this thank you very much this is gay with a last thought how will the communities get a hold of this document now i mean are, are you looking for rural community input into this document it doesn't it doesn't sound like it's it's written for researchers, primarily by researchers. I think it, in your beginning it says you've heard from one indigenous organization. Um, are you are you trying hard? And, and you may be. I just don't know um, to like I say target target communities which or regions which have an awful lot of research um, and where there have been problems in the past. Is this document acceptable? Or as is, or do they have, you know, they may have edits um, or suggestions that right. might be extremely helpful from the rural perspective to your your researchers, sort of, and again, I'm always backwards looking because um, I'm out here, but, but it, <laughs> it, it's sort of like you've been asking all the big, um, you know, the, the right places to go, and, and that takes a big effort right there from other researchers and contacting researchers, but are the stakeholders a part of this discussion regarding mm -hmm. what what you mean by effective or sustainable or um, right. that sort of thing? It's Martin so Jeffries, could I jump in? Yeah, sure. please. Hi, it's Martin Jeffries. I'm a member of the uh, revisions on the update uh, group, working with Renee and, and the others. Gay, I would say that you have part of the answer to your question because earlier you mentioned these communications networks uh, out in Northwest Alaska. And I would uh, suggest that you could help in this regard by um, raising awareness of this effort to update the principles and um, inform people that there is this opportunity to comment on them. Well, 
And this is Gay. I, I would love to do that. I think that your your written document might be difficult for people to sit down and go through and really mm -hmm. understand unless somebody was visiting with them um, either mm -hmm. on site or um, you know, really putting this document in context. And and you know, I'm not trying to get out of that, but I, I don't see I don't I have a lot of questions about this document and what it means and how to I don't know how much input you want or are looking for it. It it mm -hmm. I don't see that well yeah, yeah. So I think that the answer is we're looking for as much input as we can possibly get. And as much as we can get it into rural communities, that's what we're aiming for. Um, some of that we've done by, you know, the, the people who've been on our working group, when they're traveling in Alaska, when they're in communities, they're uh, talking about it, handing it out. Um, we've had a lot of engagement with Alaska Native people by attending, you know, some of the conferences like an Alaska, Alaska Native Health Conference and things like that, um, where we've done some listening sessions there as well. And, but are you, are you uh, just trying, you say Alaska Native people, are you just looking for communication with Alaska Native people or are you looking for communication from the entities that are Alaska Native entities such as mm -hmm. tribes, corporations, mm -hmm. um, consortia? Sure. That, yes, that also and we have been getting that. You know, we um, okay. in, the, in the AD comments that we received on the on the existing draft and how to respond to it, we right. did receive some comments from people who represent your major organizations in Alaska. Okay. Um, and we're also working with uh, people who participate in IARPIC who are also Alaska Native and who uh, we've asked them specifically, you know, to, to work through their network to have those conversations in, uh, you know, in sort of a, in a safe setting where people actually feel comfortable providing that kind of candid input about the document and so uh, we're hopeful that over the next few weeks we're going to see some more of those meetings happen and receive some feedback from people um, you know through that that kind of mechanism where it's not a, a big public forum where nobody really wants to speak out and say something that might be considered rude um, so we're, we're asking people that we know um, to you know keep pushing it out and work with their network to have the conversations about, you know, the, the document, how can it be improved? Um, does it say what needs to be said? So are you guys willing, I don't know what your deadline is, um, but are you willing to, to set up, or I can set up a teleconference? Um, it would have to be a teleconference mm -hmm. because of, we mm -hmm. couldn't do this sort of thing with our bandwidth out here, but mm -hmm. we know with the Zoom or whatever, the video, for some reason I can't, I can see you guys, but I can't, I, I don't know if you can see me. But. <laughs> Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, that happens. It, so it would have to be just a regular teleconference. But is that the is that the kind of thing that that you guys would be yeah, wanting to do? And, and what is your deadline? Um, we would like to receive comments by early September so that we have some time to uh, revise the draft. So, but I mean, we can extend that into mid September if that's better timing. So, any time in the next month, month and a half, would be really helpful. We would, we would love to have a teleconference or a set of teleconferences. Right. Well, maybe we can communicate off offline here and let these people yeah. do their thing. I, I am, I've got to go north for whaling, but anyway, let's talk okay. later. All right. Thank you. Gay. Yep. Thank you. And I, I would just share that Meredith and John um, are pretty, presenting at UIC Science Day uh, on Thursday right. as well, and we'll be there to take com uh, comments um, there. And I think Gay's uh, Cheryl's been also um, pushing it out through U.S. Mm -hmm. Arctic Research Commission net, uh, Facebook, mm -hmm. and, and um, so we are making that effort, but any help that people like Gay or others can provide um, we really welcome that. Mm -hmm. Setting up teleconferences, we'd be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. and, hey, and this is Cheryl. Um, Sarah, one suggestion might be, and I'm not sure if you guys have already tried this, but um, EPA has IGAP representatives in a lot of villages, and it, it would 
it would probably be good to try to get this information out to them and see if they would be willing to try to circulate. Okay, thank you. Yep, thanks, sure. I'll follow up with you on that. Great. You see the chat messages? Can you read them? Uh, let's see. So Stacy Fritz has sent a message. Um, see. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me to share with the ARPIC the 2018 BLM Arctic NPRA spreadsheet of permitted activities. We distribute this to all North Slope stakeholders. And people appreciate having the entire list of who, what, when, and where, and why, what is going on. So maybe, Stacy, we can also follow up with you about sharing this document through your network as well. Great. Stacy, did you have a comment? Hi, this is Stacy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah, thanks. I just, I've really been making an effort. Um, we have fewer public meetings these days, but I've really been putting a lot more effort into keeping a lot of these documents updated and available online and um, making PowerPoints with lots of links that I can distribute to people so they can find out what's going on. And this is just a really good reminder to me to be sure that now I'm going to add little blurbs and links about this IARPIC um, principles for conducting research in the Arctic to all of those documents. Right. I'm not sure, you know, uh, how, how much feedback you'll get from people, but I think they appreciate yeah. knowing that this effort is going on. That's great. Thank you, Stacey. You bet. Okay, well, I think we're pretty close to the end of our time. And again, um, please feel free to email or call or in other ways reach out if you have more thoughts uh, after the end of this session to share with us. And we really appreciate everyone who's taken the time and thinking about how um, to push this out through networks in order to um, enable people to have an opportunity to comment. So this is a better document in the end. All right, any final thoughts? Martin, did you have any final words? No, nothing further from me. Thanks very much, Renee. Well done. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thank you.